so we can all block those robocalls. <laughs> yeah. Well, we're really excited to hear about this amazing work that's that's being done at ISI, and we hope the next 50 years will be equally impressive. Um, I actually worked for Zorab Kaprilian when I was at USC, and I can absolutely see him making that kind of a decision and then informing President Hubbard the next day. <laughs> um, and thankfully, he made that decision because it's certainly proven to be the right one. So thank you very much for your work. Our next class session for all of us students is Reinventing Music History Education for 21st Century Trojans. And that will be taught today by Dr. Lisa Cooper Vest. Lisa is an assistant professor at the USC Thornton School of Music. She's a musicologist focused on post-World War II Polish music avant-garde. Wow. Her, it's very specific. Her work is in the field of Cold War studies as she considers the effects of political ideologies upon musical culture and its meanings. After her presentation, there will be time for question and answers. So please welcome Dr. Lisa Cooper Vest. all here with you and that was really interesting it's always exciting to have an opportunity to learn more about things my other colleagues are doing here at USC um, I'm Lisa Cooper Best as you just heard um, uh, my expertise is uh, well I, I wrote a book last year about the Polish avant-garde after World War II uh, that sounds very specific but more broadly I'm interested in music and politics and the way especially that nations use music to express themselves and uh, in the Polish context, I was especially thinking about how music played a role in re, uh, rebuilding the nation after the devastations of World War II. So I joined the USC faculty in 2015. Uh, this is my eighth year here at USC. And one of the most important tasks that I, sorry, So when I joined the faculty of the USC Thornton School of Music in 2015, one of my first most important tasks was that I was asked to take part in a large-scale curriculum revision that we were undergoing in that, in that time. Um, the Thornton School was looking to incorporate new kinds of classes that would help our students to meet some of the new challenges that are being faced uh, by musicians in the 21st century. We still, of course, wanted our students to benefit from the best parts of conservatory educational tradition. We still wanted them to spend important time with masters in their fields, master teachers so that they can hone their, uh, hone their skills in their, in their um, areas. We wanted them to have uh, excellent foundations in technique and pedagogy and history and theory because those have been the cornerstones of conservatory education, of music education, um, in the United States and around the world for over a century. But the truth is that in the 21st century, music students, uh, and as they move out into the world, are facing new kinds of challenges. Uh, our music students at Thornton are not only studying classical music, they're also studying jazz, popular music, music production, and music industry. They're inhabiting a new world in which they're expected to have skill sets in business, technology, communication, media literacy, and many other ways, uh, many areas. We wanted to give them tools to excel in all these different directions and to help them to dream up new ways to share their music with audiences uh, and to share their passions with others. In the music history department, I answered the challenge to build new curriculum by developing our new flagship course, Music and Ideas. 
Uh, so this was a course with some really big goals. First, our goal within Thornton was that we wanted to have an opportunity, a class in which all of our students were in the same room together. Um, a lot of the time previous to that, they were all taking classes in their own areas and they didn't always have an opportunity to meet one another and to learn from one another about um, their different traditions and their different goals and their different ways of understanding the world as musicians. Um, so this comes with a challenge. This means that when I teach this class, it has 100 second year undergraduate students in that room. Um, it's just me and 100 19 and 20 year olds. <laughs> and uh, they all have such passion for music and so many different understandings and experiences of what it means to be a musician. And that can be both extremely exciting um, to, get to hear all of their passion and to uh, uh, meet their excitement, but it can also be challenging because they have different ideas of what it means to be a musician, different kinds of goals, different relationship to their world. I was also working with three related pedagogical goals. Uh, first, this is a, essentially a critical thinking and writing class. It's not a traditional music history class where we start at the beginning of, uh, of music and chart our way to the future. That would be much too difficult with so many different musical traditions in the room. So the students leave my class. When they leave my class, they go on to a traditional music history survey in their respective areas. They'll take a classical survey or a jazz survey. But my uh, task in Music and Ideas is to challenge them to think critically about big questions that affect all of them and to give them tools to think through those questions and to apply them through writing and through discussion and through presentation uh, and to apply those to their own lives. Um, I also uh, have as a goal meaningful engagement with diverse musical traditions. Because all of our students are in this room together, it's really important to me to give them opportunities to learn from one another's musical traditions. Um, so this means that I'm constantly including um, case studies from all the different traditions that are represented at the Thornton School um, and give them opportunities as well to bring their experiences and their knowledge into the, into the room. I also take very seriously Thornton's commitment to meaningful just, justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. So I highlight marginalized voices whenever I can, and I also ask questions about how those voices came to be marginalized and to strategize about how we can create conditions for greater access and equity in today's music world. And then finally, uh, this leads to my final goal, which is to challenge students to apply all these things that we're learning in class to their own musical practice. Primarily that happens through the final project in the course, which is not a traditional research paper, but rather a grant proposal. In the current 21st century world, all of our students are gonna be writing to promote themselves and to um, uh, establish opportunities and to seek funding and support for their various um, initiatives. And so this final project does ask them to use research to support their arguments and to position themselves in relationship to their goals, but ultimately I'm asking them to dream big and to think about how they could share their musical practice with audiences in new ways and to challenge people to hear and listen to music, uh, to think about music in, in new ways. And to, uh, I've been blown away over the years by how much our students want to make an impact on the world and how many creative ideas I've received in these final projects. So in the remainder of my uh, short talk, I want to give you an example of a lecture topic that I've taught many times in this class, trying to kind of draw lines across all of these students that I have in this space. Um, so for this example, I want to talk about what it means to be a virtuoso performer. Um, many of our students at Thornton have as a goal to be uh, excellent performers, uh, virtuoso performers, but they don't always think about what that means or what it has meant over time or where our traditions of virtuosity come from. Um, so with every lecture that I teach in this class, I begin with a series of critical guiding questions that help us to see what the larger picture is so we don't drown in all the details. Um, I might start with a question, what does it mean to be a virtuoso? Um, this question allows me to open some historical questions. Um, I can guide them to understand that uh, our current, uh, we, we think very easily about superstar performers in our current age, but that, that has not been with us forever. 
um, the, 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 the superstar performer is really uh, something that uh, uh, started happening as a phenomenon in the early 19th century uh, as a confluence of a bunch of new uh, things that were happening at the beginning of the 19th century. For instance, um, the availability of public concerts, com public concert halls that were open to people to buy tickets and come into them. That was not a thing that happened in the 18th century. It was something that happened at the beginning of the 19th century. Suddenly you had these spaces where people could buy tickets and come in to see famous musicians and to hear them. Um, also, things were happening with technology. Uh, you had uh, new technological developments in instruments, which meant that suddenly you could hear them in a large space. The instrument that Beethoven played on it, at the turn of the uh, 19th century was very different than the piano, like the one that we have here in this room, uh, uh, which has remained mostly the same since uh, the early 19th century. Within a, a short period of two to three decades, that instrument became modernized and was possible to be heard in a large space. Also, developments in marketing and technology and printing allowed for the support of a virtuoso superstar to rise. You had to be able to promote them and to print about them and to uh, uh, distribute images of them. And then in the 20th century, the advent of recorded sound and of video changed the way we interacted with superstar performers. And now in the 21st century, streaming video and all these different uh, uh, ways that we can access this music. So I take them through this historical trajectory. Um, then the second and third questions relate to how those uh, uh, ideas change over time. What kinds of expectations do audiences bring to virtual for those performers? So how are the artists responding to expectations that audiences have for them? And how do those expectations shift in different historical and musical contexts? This allows us also to think about how uh, the virtuoso sounds and looks different in different musical traditions and different musical styles and different times. Um, this also gives them time to reflect on their own expectations of what a virtuoso sounds like and what they hope to be as uh, performers. And then finally, my last question brings us to the question of application. In what ways can performers challenge audience expectations of their virtuosity? Um, here I want the students to really think about what they bring to the table and how they might frame themselves and their artistic practice moving out into the world. Um, okay, so uh, I've brought a few musical examples that I want to uh, share with you, just to give you a sense of what I do with my students uh, moving through. So I have, uh, I want to start here with Franz Liszt, who was a Hungarian pianist uh, uh, performing at the beginning of the 19th century. And he's in some ways one of these artists we might identify as being uh, one of the first great superstars, uh, international superstars of the world. Uh, he was playing on this modern piano. Um, and he was known for, actually he was known for destroying pianos on stage. He would play them so hard that they would break. Oh it was one of his uh, concert tricks. You can see this. A uh, caricature here with uh, notes pouring out of the piano. You can see there's great activity and action there. Um, I love this uh, sculpture by the French sculptor uh, Danton from uh, uh, 1836, in which all you have is Liszt's hair. Like his hair is just kind of uh, uh, demonstrating the physicality of, of his performance. In this bottom uh, image, you see the, the crowds of ladies that would appear at his concerts throwing gifts and roses at him. <laughs> he was really the Elvis of his moment. People would come and just, he was a, he was a superstar. Uh, so Liszt, and I might also point a contrast here between the iconography around Liszt and another virtuoso from the same period, Clara Wieck Schumann, who was uh, a female virtuoso of the same moment. And you can see that her presentation is very different. She uh, presented always in white dresses, very demure. Her hair is very perfect. There's no uh, hair moving around. Uh, so it's very, we can bring in some contrast there as well. Uh, I'm going to play an example from Liszt's uh, Paganini Etudes, written in 1851. Uh, you can see here that he's using the whole range of the piano. In fact, people uh, often say that to play Liszt, you have to have three hands, and you can hear that coming here. Um, he's also uh, drawing on the tradition uh, that preceded him here uh, by setting a text or a musical uh, example from Paganini, who was also uh, a violin uh, virtuoso uh, exactly preceding him. This is the very end of the Paganini Etudes. Mark 
Andre Hamelin playing. I might then introduce an example from the amazing electric guitar virtuoso, Eddie Van Halen, who uh, was known in the 70s and the 80s for just uh, revolutionizing the way that the uh, electric guitar was being played. Um, his solo eruption was first recorded in the 70s, but he continued to play it through the 80s. And my students are often interested to note similarities between the iconography of Liszt and, Li and uh, Eddie Van Halen's, Van Halen's presentation. They're both presenting very physically. They're, they're larger than life. They're both presenting a certain kind of masculinity, even though that, the, the idea of masculinity had changed over the convening, uh, intervening decade, uh, uh, century. And, uh, but also, I want to point out that Eddie Van Halen is also quoting uh, uh, a musical excerpt from a 19th century virtuoso Kreutzer in this uh, violin etude in this solo. So he's also putting himself into that virtuoso tradition. <laughs> who revolutionized the rock and roll guitar uh, in the 50s and 60s. She was really, she had one foot in the black gospel and blues tradition, one foot in the rock and roll tradition, and as a result, she kind of was often overlooked in both traditions as kind of not existing fully within um, that space, but she was enormously influential for figures such as Elvis and other uh, electric guitarists moving forward. This is a performance from 1964. 